The B58 Hustler is visually stunning. It is beautiful. I remember seeing it for the first time in a coloring book my parents gave me when I was a child. For the time, it was also one of the most advanced aircraft ever built and operated. And yet its operation story has been short and unremarkable, or better, it was punctuated by records and accidents, but it never fired a shot in anger, nor did it really contribute to the general deterrence mission. This is the first video of a series where we will go through its history and the myriad of groundbreaking technologies implemented on the plane. As usual, stay till the end, because the stuff that we are going to discuss here is very difficult to find anywhere else. Curtis LeMay was already a legend in 1948 when he returned to the United States to head the Strategic Air Command from its headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base. He found that this small situation, half of the planes were not available, the crews were poorly trained, the base security was disregarded. Mock bombing results were appalling, so with his characteristic energy he set off to fix the situation. Under his tenure, many staples of the Air Force doctrine during the Cold War were implemented, but for our story, what is important is that a particular program happened under his supervision. One step back. Since October 1946, the Air Force was running a theoretical study known as GIBO-1 to define the general configuration of the bomber of the future. However, since those years were years of booming developments in aerospace technology, in April 1950 the Air Force moved on to the GIBO-2 concept. It was supposed to be a long-range bomber program but the speed was left undefined. The acceptable speed range was set from transonic to moderately supersonic. Uh, we will cover the details in a future video, but in 1951, two proposals received funding for further development. The Boeing proposal was discarded because it was thought to be less performing than the conveyor model. After all, Boeing already had on its table the design of one of the most famous military planes of our times. The convert proposal, though, was for a small delta wing parasite aircraft launched from a derivative of the turboprop B 36. Uh, the parasite idea was quickly abandoned, even because the new air refueling capabilities being developed at the time, well, they rapidly pushed the parasite planes in the Curiosity realms. However, the new bomber configuration remained the same, a beautiful delta wing. The official development contract was issued in February 1953. So while LeMay finally seemed to have his supersonic bomber, Convair was also working on the F-102 and the F-106. While it is clear that the experience of the two fighters heavily influenced the B-58 configuration, the B-58 actually inherited something else from the fighter programs. For the F-102B, the so-called Cook Ridge approach was taken. No prototype was built, but a limited number of production units had to be delivered, so changes could be incorporated directly on the production line. This could shorten the time to delivery if there was just a limited number of changes to make, but they risk having a relatively large number of underperforming airplanes already built that might have required a complex and expensive retrofit. Obviously, the same approach was chosen for the B-58. The first B-58 rolled out from the production line in August 1956, and the maiden flight happened in November. The flight testing program was conducted on 30 different airframes, each of them a bit different from the previous one, as <laughs> all the improvements were progressively incorporated. The test campaign was concluded in April 1959. At the end of the day, 30 development and 86 production B-58A were produced, 
eventually all the 30 test airframes were converted to production standard with a painfully expensive program. If in this moment you are thinking to what is happening with a much more modern plane, I won't stop you. In August 1960, the B-58 was declared operational. It was a beautiful, elegant Delta Wing aircraft with four large engines. It seemed coming straight from a Jeff Oakey comics. The plane took its place in the United States Air Force in the role of deep nuclear strike with a large nuclear weapon. Curtis LeMay finally could have a go with his supersonic bomber and we are wondering if he kept smoking his cigar during the flight. Also, in the same years, the plane kept obtaining speed and altitude records, increasing its prestige and exposure with the media. So everything was good and they lived happily ever after. No, it was a disaster. The plane was horribly expensive to build. Pilot training was also expensive because they had to be trained on the F-102 Delta Dagger to familiarize with the peculiarity of Delta wings. The massive amount of new technology incorporated into the plane required highly trained ground personnel and an insane amount of man hours to keep it operational. Pilots loved the plane because its speed performance was stunning. It could cruise at Mach 2 at high altitude. But it was tormentingly difficult to fly, requiring constant attention and supervision. It suffered a sudden shift of center of gravity, it was easy to depart into spin and very difficult to recover. It took off and landed at scary high speed and frightening angles of attack. In 10 years of operating life, 20% of the B-58s were lost in flight accidents. When LeMay flew in one, he found it cramped and unsuitable for long duration missions. Finally, the operating range was never really satisfactory and the B-58 required too many tanker missions to execute its own. However, it wasn't all doom and gloom, it was worse. The 1st of May 1960, the IU-2 spy plane flown by Francis Gary Powers was shot down by an S-75 Dvina Soviet surface to missile, well within the territory of the Soviet Union. This obviously caused concern, but the B-58 that was just entering service seemed safe at almost 20 km above the ground at a speed of Mach 2. Then reports of the missile capabilities and the Soviet air defense density started to pour in. The B-58 production was not over yet, and the plane was already obsolete. So the B-58 wings changed their tactics to low-level penetration, a mission in which it was spectacular to see. However, flying a plane difficult to handle and up to the ground well, is definitely not ideal and the speed at sea level was subsonic and the operating range was even shorter. It was clearly only a matter of time. When the young McNamara became Secretary of the Defense, the B-58 was one of the programs that attracted his attention. It was a hard political fight, but the United States Air Force was ordered to decommission the plane by 1970. And so it happened. B-58 Astra bomber took the skies the 11th of November 1956. It was incredible. Never before such a concentration of revolutionary technology was ever included in an aircraft. One of the first revolutionary features of the B-58 Hustler was the use of new structural designs and materials in constructing the aircraft. The aircraft structure was heavily stressed, not only in terms of aerodynamic loads, but also because of its high speed. True skin friction at Mach 2 
the exterior surfaces could reach temperatures above 250 degrees Fahrenheit. With the inboard jet engines venting their exhaust beneath the wing, there was also a concern over sonic vibration fatigue at high sound level affecting the wing structure. Sound may not seem a source of stress, but it is. It is vibrations at the end. So, in an extreme test, Convair actually ran the inboard engines of a B-58 for 10 hours with afterburners, causing sound levels up to 171 decibels to test the wing structure for sonic fatigue. And yes, it was on the ground, obviously. Some say that internally the B-58 was built like a ship. Surely it was a departure from classic airframe structures. It actually featured transverse duraluminium spars corrugated for strength, spaced only 11 to 15 inches apart, running from one wing margin through the fuselage to the extremity of the opposite wing. There were no cordwise ribs, only short cordwise or oblique structural elements to serve as attachments for elevons, engine nacelles and landing gear. For covering the wing, Convair created a new material, a new type of composite. Stiff, strong, light, relatively easy to replace and with good thermal insulating qualities. It was named the bonded sandwich panel. The top and bottom of the sandwich was covered with panels of duraluminium alloy about one millimeter thick. The filling, about half inch thick, was made of tiny honeycombs of phenolic resin impregnated fiberglass cloth. The core was bonded to the outer layers with phenolic adhesives and then heated at a pressure of 175 psi at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. Absolute cleanliness was essential for solid bonding and the department of the conveyor plant where this was done was known as the hospital. Finally, the panel was attached to the wing structure with titanium screws to allow for an easier and stress-free replacement. In areas exposed to high temperatures, such as the aft section of the engine nacelles and the elegons, uh, which dip into the blast of the jet, panels of stainless steel sandwich replace the fiberglass ones. The concept that led to this revolutionary design was called high density by Convair. In practice, they tried using all the available internal volume for something. This led to a design where the whole interior of the wing and most of the interior of the fuselage were filled with fuel. The space enclosed by the wing and the fuselage aft of the crew compartment was divided by bulkheads into four tanks. The largest was the aft tank in the aft portion of the wing and it contained a maximum of 39,800 pounds of JP4 fuel. The forward tank in the forward part of the wing contained a maximum of 20,600 pounds of fuel and there was also a reservoir tank above the wing with 4,200 pounds. In the tail of the aircraft at the level of the elevons was located the balanced tank containing a maximum of 8,200 pounds of fuel. The pods carried beneath the aircraft were also largely filled with fuel. The MB pod was 57 foot long and contained mostly fuel other than the nuclear warhead. The TC pod was in two parts. A 54 foot long lower element wood that was designed to be dropped before the high speed penetration leg and it was filled entirely with fuel. A 35 foot long upper pod contained 2,500 pounds of fuel and a warhead. When filled to the brim, the Hustler could carry in its internal and pod tanks a maximum of 101 1,600 pounds of JP4, about 57% of the gross weight of the plane. The fact that the fuel was a high fraction of the total weight was a source of problems. At supersonic speeds, the center of pressure moves well aft of its subsonic location, and ideally the pilot would move the center of gravity backwards as well 
to maintain the appropriate stability and to reduce the trim drag for the most economical cruise. Trim drag was a serious problem on the B-58, like all the early deltas. The B-58 flight manual was full of tables stating the best position for the center of gravity depending on the weight, the speed and the height. An automatic computer control programmer pumped the fuel aft from the forward tank to the balance tank or forward into the forward tank as necessary to bring the center of gravity within the required limits. This feature was absolutely critical because in case of malfunction, the center of gravity shifts could be lethal for the aircraft. Complete loss of control. The center of gravity position was constantly checked by one of the crew members to be ready to fix malfunctions and the pilot was constantly informed. The four engines of the B-58 Hustler were General Electric J795As, or 5Bs. They were rated at 10,000 pounds with maximum afterburner. The engines were remarkable for the time because they had variable position inlet guide vanes and variable position stator vanes in the first six stages of the compressor. These were automatically set in relation to engine speed and compressor inlet temperature to admit the correct amount of air to the compressor and to direct it against the rotating compressor vanes at the proper angle of attack, thereby minimizing the possibility of compressor stall. Nozzle flap in the engine outlet area provided for optimum thrust and specific fuel consumption under different engine operating conditions and they were opened and closed by the throttles. The throttles had six settings. Three were the classic off, idle and military. To achieve the design speed, the Hustler had to be driven by the afterburners and these increase their thrust as the throttles are advanced to min afterburner, max afterburner and OVSP, that is overspeed. In the latter setting, the engines were allowed to overspeed at 103.5% of their maximum RPM. I was actually unable to verify the point, but it seems also that there was a way of operating at 107% RPM for 5 seconds or less. But operating above 107% for any engine uh, required the engine to be returned to the factory for a full overhaul. With a takeoff gross weight of 163,000 pounds, a landing gross weight of 75,000 pounds, and a touchdown speed of 165 knots, the landing gear, the wheels, and the brakes of the B 58 took a hard punishment. The two main gears featured four non frangible steel wheels, each bearing to 22 inches diameter tires inflated to 240 psi. An enormous amount of energy was absorbed even in a normal landing. The brakes could be heated to the point that tires or hydraulic fluid fires were expected. Firefighters had to approach the landing gear from the front or the rear due to the danger of tire explosions. There were also two separate and independent hydraulic systems, the primary and utility, each having two engine-driven pumps maintaining a pressure of 3000 psi. Both systems shared the operation of the flight controls, the elevons and the rudders. Should one fail, the other system could assume the full load. Should both hydraulic systems fail, the pilot had no further means of controlling the aircraft and the crew had to eject. The hydraulic system also operated the landing gear, nose wheel steering, wheel brakes, tail turret, aileron elevator and the rudder damper servos. A pneumatic system was available for emergency extension of the landing gear and for emergency braking. Electric generators driven by engines number 1, 2 and 3 provided 115 or 200 volt alternating current which powered part of the avionics and the fuel pumps. Some of the alternating current was rectified to provide multiple direct current between 28 and 250 volts 
to caution and warning lamps and other avionics working in DC. The defense system's operator's cockpit was practically lined with panels of individual fuses which were uh, to be checked by running the hand over them a small pin protruding from the cap marked a blown fuse. Other fuse panels were in the navigator's cockpit. featured an unusual cockpit configuration, three separated cockpits in a line. There was no physical communication between them, except for the intercom each crew member was on his own, in cramped quarters which did not permit standing for missions lasting seven to eight hours. The pilot had vision ahead and to the sides through a six-window windshield, plus two small windows in the canopy for overhead vision. The Bombardier navigator and the defense operator had a minute window with the size of a notebook on each side of their cockpit. These were basically there to avoid the claustrophobia, but often they were covered by opaque cloth curtains. Each cockpit had its own individual canopy. It was hinged at the rear, moved pneumatically and it could be jettisoned if necessary. Each cockpit also had an individual escape capsule, the first enclosed escape system in an aircraft in regular service use. Flight personnel was sized for the capsule at the start of the training course and it was an essential requirement to remain in the program. The capsule could be closed and pressurized within 7 seconds in case of loss of cabin pressure at high altitude, enabling the flight personnel to avoid pressure suits. In this situation, the pilot could see part of his instrument panel through a window in the capsule door and with full control through the stick inside the capsule, he then could fly the aircraft to a lower altitude and then decapsulate. Is that a word? Buttons on the stick, a sort of early HOTAS configuration, enabled him to disconnect the autopilot, shift the center of gravity and retard the throttles while encapsulated. In an emergency, rockets ejected the capsule from the aircraft, with the enclosed personnel being protected against the harshness of the situation. After the deceleration of the capsule, the parachute deployed. Obviously, the capsule contained survival gear, including a radio, rations, water, the salting gear, clothing, and a rifle. It would stay uh, afloat if it landed in the sea. Liquid oxygen was used to feed the pressure breathing masks. The interior of the crew space was cooled by two separate air conditioning systems. In a sort of direct flow, the cabin and the crew member was cooled. Then the heat generated by the electronics was actually removed by the same air pumped through the cabin. If the electronics was in full use and it was generating too much heat, the flow was inverted and the electronics was cooled first while the crew member started sweating. To get the Huster, the pilot had a pair of conventional rudder pedals and a massive plastic control stick, uh, with which he made the conventional control movements. Yet, he was not moving the rudder and the elevons, but he merely was activating valves which, through a power control linkage assembly, moved the control surfaces by hydraulic force. The system was efficient, but it was plagued by the stick talk back issue, a pulsating kick of the control stick when the hydraulic pressure fluctuated at the stick's extreme limits of movement. 
In a system like this, there is no transmission of control surface feedback through the stick and pedals, so an artificial field system provided a substitute. Other features of the flight control system were automatic, responding not to the pilot input but to the commands from the autopilot computer. It derived information from the air data computer, Mach number, temperature and altitude, the gross weight computer, the tracking and flight control and crew unit, pitch and roll correction, primary navigation system, pitch, roll and heading signals, and the rate gyro and accelerometer package. These assemblies control the action of the autopilot, which could also vary the engine power, together with other automatic features of the flight control system. For instance, damper servos move the control surfaces automatically to damp the rate of pitch, roll and yaw because undamped movement of the hustler at supersonic speed in particular could have been dangerous as the aerodynamic load might have exceeded the structural limits. Now, think how excruciatingly difficult would have been doing all of this with the computers available at the time, most of them still analog devices. An automatic elevator trim system positioned the elevons to maintain constant 1G flight with the control stick in neutral. The angle assumed by the elevator depended from the airspeed, the gross weight and the location of the center of gravity. It was indicated on the instrument panel on the elevator position indicator. Another dial indicated the amount of elevator movement possible. This depended in turn on the airspeed and it was determined by the elevator ratio changer. The latter, in response to the Mac computer signals, varied the stick to control surface mechanical ratio in order to protect the aircraft against excessive G loads. All of this may seem very complicated, but it basically means that in this way, large control movements were used at lower speeds, while at high subsonic speeds, control surfaces movement was to be limited because the high uh, air pressure involved. However, at supersonic speed, with the control surfaces blanketed by shock waves, larger surface movements were required to produce the same effect. The aileron controls likewise had an automatic trim and ratio changer. By now, it should be clear that so much could go wrong so quickly in the Huster that two separate sets of warning signals, visual and auditory, were used to draw the pilot's attention to any malfunction. On the left side of the instrument panel, there was a red master warning light and a yellow one marked master caution. When lit, this drew the pilot attention to warning and caution panels on the right side of the cockpit, where individual lamps indicated the specific trouble. Um, things like left fuel manifold low pressure, oil low number one, reservoir tank not full, aft pump number eight, hydraulic utility pump number two, cabin pressure left, all these kind of things. But this was not everything because a voice warning system was developed for the hustler. A pre-recorded feminine voice used to break into the masculine chatter in the pilot's earphones with one of the 20 announcements like Weapon unlocked, hydraulic system failure, check for engine fire, news too high. It was the first time that anything like that was implemented and it was the cause a lot of jokes and banter. Sperry built the AM ASQ 42 bombing and navigation system, which was a masterpiece of the analog age. When operating in the navigation mode, it was literally capable of directing the B 58 Hustler by the autopilot along a great circle track at a constant Mach number and altitude to any point on the globe. The navigator simply had to set the latitude and the longitude of his true present position on his navigational control board and the latitude and longitude of his destination position on the sighting and test panel. The computer occupying the front of his cockpit did the rest, with the help of the data coming from an array of sensors. 
towards the rear of the aircraft in the fuselage between the forward and aft fuel tanks was located the uh, inertial navigation system with the so-called stable table whose attitude was gyroscopically fixed while the aircraft moved around in pitch roll and yo. It was also used to provide a secondary measure of the ground speed. The primary ground speed source was a Doppler radar transmitter and receiver in the tail measuring the true ground speed by the Doppler shift of the radar signal. Above the stabilization unit and protruding slightly above the skin of the fuselage, there was a transparent and rounded cupola for the star tracker unit. Bisecting on the astro control panel the Greenwich hour angle, the sidereal hour angle and the declination of the sun or of a star to be used for navigation purposes, the system could lock on the sun or the star. It provided continuous heading information to the computer. Should the celestial bodies be obscured, heading data could be received from the remote compass transmitter inside the leading edge of the fin. The search radar in the nose displaying a radar representation of the terrain below on the scope in the navigator's cockpit uh, provided a further check on position. Crosshairs in the scope itself indicated when certain fixed points on the ground preset into the computer were coming into view. A radio altimeter measured the height above the terrain. The air data system also fed the true airspeed, pressure and altitude and air temperature into the computer. In the bombing mode, the bombing and navigation system guided the aircraft on a loxodrome line over the target, compensating for wind drift and Coriolis effect, while offset points and fixed points set into the machine beforehand came up beneath the crosshairs in the radar scope. During the run-in, the navigator, while watching the terrain below on the radar, could make small correction in heading with the tracking and flight control stick in his right hand, which operated through the autopilot. At the time calculated to provide a burst over the target, the bomb nav system in the bombing mode automatically released the weapon, a feature that was going to appear much later on other aircraft. The defense system operator in the third cockpit assisted the pilots during flight by reading checklists, advising the pilot on fuel consumption, optimum altitude, and the extremely important location of the center of gravity. His primary duties, however, were in connection with the defense systems. The plane featured track braking electronic equipment designed to mislead and confuse the operator of enemy radar uh, to enable the hustler to accomplish its mission unaffected by ground-to-air defenses. And this sounds incredible for the 50s. A six-barrel Vulcan 20mm cannon located in the extreme tail was directed by remote control equipment. Enemy aircraft were presented as a blip on the defense system operator's radar scope and the fire control equipment automatically locked onto the target calculated the lead and windage, aimed the gun and notified the DSO when to fire it. Uh, this was necessary because the attacking enemy aircraft was not visible to the Hustler crew. We are going to cover what we did not cover at the beginning, the long and exciting story from its inception to its deployment. The Boeing B-47 and B-52 Strato Fortress, uh, developed in the late 40s, represented the application of jet power to the conventional bombing concept of the day. Traveling at subsonic speed, the two big Boeings were intended to penetrate enemy airspace at great altitudes and were originally designed to carry conventional bombs and nuclear payloads as well. 
The supersonic B-58 Huster, on the other hand, derived from a new concept developed in the late 40s and early 50s. The concept started considering the fast increasing capability of ground defenses including radar tracking and surface-to-air missiles. On one hand, it was realized that the bomber of the future had to have the highest possible speed and therefore be capable of supersonic flight. This called for a relatively small aircraft of unconventional shape and with unconventional characteristics, for example, the Delta Wing, a droppable externally carried bomb pod was conceived from the beginning as a means of bomb release at supersonic speed. On the other hand, it was clear that the jet fuel consumption at supersonic speed would not permit the small aircraft to go all the way from its continental base to the target in the enemy territory flying at Mach 2. The bomber was therefore to be carried as a parasite under a large and slow transport aircraft. So the journey was divided into three zones. The logistics zone at the start, during which the parasite would be attached to the parent transport. Um, the combat zone near the enemy's border, where the parasite would be released. And the target zone, into which the short-range bomber would penetrate at supersonic speed to bomb and return to the parent aircraft. Contrary to what many think, low and high altitude were both considered as well. Convert firm of Fort Worth, Texas, uh, to be merged in 1954 with uh, General Dynamics, had been involved in advanced bomber design studies since October 46. At that time, it received a contract with the Air Force for a theoretical study of the long-range subsonic bomber of the future, known as the time as the GIBO, G -E -B -O, Generalized Bomber. Approximately 10,000 configurations on paper were studied and compared with respect to speed, range and gross weight and involving different combinations of wing area, aspect ratios, sweep back, turboprop and pure jet propulsion. I actually wonder where this number is coming from. It seems rather impossible in an era with no digital computers, but the sources say so and... Ultimately, this study led to an Air Force requirement for a medium bomber with a gross weight of 200,000 pounds, a radius of 2,000 miles and 10,000 pounds bomb load. On June 6, 1949, Convair received from the Air Force a contract to continue uh, the generalized bomber studies under the designation of GBO-2. Initially, they were called on to attempt to settle the turboprop versus turbojet power plant controversy and to apply the solution to a bomber with a radius of uh, 1,200 to 2,500 nautical miles, 10,000 pounds bomb load, cruising uh, speed of over 450 knots, flight altitude above 35,000 feet. However, in April 1950, the Jebo 2 requirement was changed for a system able to attack targets 3,000 to 4,500 nautical miles distant at a speed between Mach 09 to 1.5. Convair had already proposed in January 1950 a small delta wing composite uh, carrying two men, which would be transported into the target zone by a B-36. With one engine in the tail, two droppable jet engines under the wings, and one in the tail of the long finned bomb pod, all without afterburners, the parasite would have a launch weight of 100,000 pounds, would cruise to the target Mach 1.3, increasing to Mach 1.6 over the target and reach a maximum altitude of 48,500 feet before pod release. After the attack, the return component would fly back to the B-36 with a single engine at Mach 0.9. A modification in the fall of 1950 involved two fixed jet engines buried in the wings, two droppable engines under the wings and a 50 in the long streamline pod plus an advanced bombing navigational system. Both configurations featured passive electronic countermeasures but no active defense. Originally the pod was intended to carry conventional explosives but early in the GBO2 program 
a thermonuclear warhead was incorporated. The long finned and streamlined pod with a jet engine in its tail could function as an air launch missile and as late as 1953 it was expected that the pod with propellant system and fins would have a range of 100 nautical miles. And this was an early interpretation of the standoff air-to-ground missile. Though the XB-55 had been cancelled, Boeing was working on a four-jet shoulder wing bomber, the Project MX-1022 with 47 degrees whip back of the leading edge, a type reminiscent of that of the B-47, and a three-man crew. Uh, later, this was to be referred as XB-59. The Air Force budget for the fiscal 1951 and 1952 supported both the Boeing design and the convergible to Delta parasite. And in February 1951, both firms received phase one contracts. The Convair MX 1626 proposal was for a small delta wing bomber to be carried as a parasite under a turboprop power B-60, the swept back variation of the B-36. It would now have only three known afterburning engine, two fixed one in wing nacelles and one in the pod, a gross weight of 177,000 pounds, two-man crew and a small landing gear to carry the weight of the return component only. During the phase one studies of the MX 1626 proposal, the parasite approach was dropped in favor of in-flight refueling using the early probe and drug method just then coming into service. The expendable engine principle was also discarded and the MX 1626 design, which emerged in December 1951, was for a small delta with two fixed engine in nacelles in the wings for the first time with afterburners and a long slender bomb pod, its nose extended forward beyond that of the aircraft and containing the ground search radar, the tail had three swept back fins and its upper surface was flush to the lower portion of the fuselage. With a crew of three, this craft had a radius of 2300 nautical miles from advanced bases or 4400 nautical miles in intercontinental operations with a single outbound refueling. The bomb pod, functioning as an air-to-ground missile, had a range of 50 nautical miles. The progress of the two supersonic designs encouraged uh, the Air Force Directorate of Requirements to publish in December 1951 a General Operational Requirement GOR, for a Strategic Bombardment System ASAB-51 with a minimal operational radius uh, using uh, the single refueling concept of 2,000 nautical miles. The ability to fly at 50,000 feet, but also low altitude capability at high subsonic speed and a maximum supersonic dash capability. Both Boeing and Convair competed for a contract. The Convair contender designated the MX 1964 resembled the MX 1626, but it had four jet engines with afterburners, impaired pods in each wing, takeoff gross weight increased to 140,000 pounds, the wing area was increased as well, it featured a delta wing with a sweep back of 60 degrees, and a tail turret with an automatic cannon was added. Boeing continued work on their design, and now the MX 1965, but when both detailed Phase 1 designs were presented to the Air Research and Development Command in October 1952, the larger Boeing design was rejected as being less capable of achieving the specified supersonic performance. <laughs> Considering that Boeing was already involved with the B-52 program, it seems a sort of fair decision. The Convair design was held to provide the most promising means of achieving supersonic capability with minimum size, thanks to the Convair engineering staff's insistence on producing a high-density aircraft. In addition, Convair was four to six months ahead of Boeing in detailed design. So they received a full-scale phase one development contract using the MX 1964 design as a basis, with the further instruction that the aircraft would be known as the B, 58. It was at this time the Convair design staff was using the name Hustler to designate the MX 1964. To the regret of some, the name stuck and even became official in the end. <music> well, 
about the rest of war's development and details, details, details. In March 1953, the aft fuselage was fined down under transonic carrier rule and the four engines were distributed in four separate staggered pods. The leading edge of the wing was cumbered and twisted to minimize the loss of efficiency at the tips. A small 10 degree trailing edge angle was added to the wing, increasing the area to uh, 1,542 square feet and the takeoff weight increased to 150,000 pounds. In September 1953, the four jet engines were again in twin pods, hung on pylons under the wing with added fuel for intercontinental flight in wingtip tanks. The search radar, which had extended out ahead in the nose of the bomb pod, was mounted in the nose of the aircraft, enabling the pod to be shortened. In August 1954, the airframe was redesigned for the last time in the light of the supersonic area rule. The jet engine nacelles were hung individually under the wings, the fuselage redesigned with additional room for fuel, permitting the tip tanks to be eliminated. Guys, take a decision. Wind tunnel tests confirmed that a significant increase in supersonic performance could be expected. And finally, this design was unchanged up to the date of the first flight, the 11th of November 1956. From this point on, we have already told the story of the B-58 and described its particularities, and now I invite you to refer back to the previous three parts of this series. This was quite a long series. It took quite a long time, but the B-58 was such an extraordinary plane that it utterly deserved it. So if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. If you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and see you the next time.